Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, so my name is Sasha. I live in Amsterdam, as mentioned. If you've seen me on, Squir on Twitter, you may have noticed me as that squirrel, which has its own long story. Uh, I'm not actually involved with Django Girls, but I do a lot of work around Python and Django. I organize Django conferences. Uh, I'm on the team. I'm on the Code of Conduct Committee of the Django Software Foundation. And I do a lot of other things around community. I may also be the only person here who has never used Scala, and I never actually heard of type level before this conference. Um, and I also want to mention my co-author and originally my co-presenter of this talk, which is Mikey Ariel, a very dear friend of mine. And uh, we wrote this talk together initially, which was an interesting journey that I'll come back to a few times, but it really would not have existed without her. So. This talk is based on a mix of experiences from uh, myself, from Mikey, but also from a lot of community members uh, that shared their stories with us. And I'd like to ask you to keep in mind that the point of this talk is to help trust and openness, because we're going to touch on some sensitive issues, especially for some people. Um, maybe people will feel more comfortable to have some personal conversations that they may not have uh, felt comfortable having before. So. I'd like to ask you to handle what, with kindness whatever is shared, both in this talk and afterwards. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, why none of us are alone. Because with many people that I meet, myself, it often feels like they have their entire life together, they have a ton of friends that they do amazing things with, their work is all amazing, and they have so much fun doing that. They get along with everyone they meet instantly. Uh, they are always doing some new amazing project, and it always ends up well for them. And everything always seems entirely smooth for them, from my perspective. But over the years that I found with that, many of the people that I felt about this way, when I get to know them better, they sometimes open up to me, and then I find out how wrong I was about these things. Because I found that for many of the people that I admired the most, and sometimes even envied, uh, the people that seem to have everything together more than everyone else that I know, I was actually wrong. Because once they open up to me, uh, a lot of them share stories about depression, about crippling anxiety, OCD, PTSD, sometimes even self-harm. And I felt completely blindsided again and again by how serious some of these stories sometimes are and that I never imagined that person to struggle in that way and impressed by what they still accomplish. But it's left me increasingly thinking that I probably actually know very few people who, uh, who have never struggled with their well-being, but that many of them simply haven't uh, felt like sharing that with me, which is fine if they don't want to. But it's taught me that no matter how successful someone may seem and how amazing everything seems to go in their work and everything they make, and they seem to have boundless creativity, they may very well be spending tremendous amounts of energy just to get through their daily life. Um, because, for example, around one in four people will experience mental illness in their lifetime, which means something could be something that uh, affects your entire life, so, and that has started at the start of your life, like development disorders. It can be things that surface later, like uh, a burnout or OCD. And once they show, sometimes they affect a few years of their life, sometimes it, is, it defines the rest of your life from then on. Um, and so there's a lot of variation in this, and this might still seem like quite a minority, although if you look at this room, that means there's 50 people in this room who have or will experience this. But so many people struggle with their well-being in things that don't necessarily meet criteria for diagnosis. Uh, like 70% of office workers regularly report physical symptoms due to excessive stress, which means their stress level is so high and so consistently high that they suffer from being excessively tired, poor sleep, head and neck pain are classic, uh, digestive problems, and lots of other things, which may not always meet the bar for a formal diagnosis, but it's definitely something that harms your well-being, especially in the long run. Um, so even though a minority of people experience mental illness, a large majority will, in the future, or is already suffering from issues that affect their well-being and have an impact on their life. But hiding these kind of issues, especially when it comes to mental well-being, it's very ingrained into many of our cultures. And we just say, oh, you know, I'm fine, I'm just tired. It's such a natural thing for people to say when they're not doing well. But the reality of it is that 
I know that there are other people in every community that struggle, and sometimes that's a lot, sometimes it's a bit, uh, and it varies over time, and I know some of those people, and I've heard their stories, but I'm sure I haven't heard nearly all of them. It will also be exhausting. But it's left me convinced that if you're struggling with things, there's very likely to be someone else in this room who actually knows what that is like. Um, because there are probably, there's someone in this room who has struggled with depression, people with low self-esteem, histories of eating disorders, social anxiety, gender dysphoria, self-identity issues, and there's so much more. And there are even more people that might not struggle in the same way, but that understand because they know what it's like when, when things aren't always so easy and when it's hard to talk about them. And I don't necessarily know who those people are, but I do know that they're here. So at DjangoCon Europe 2015, uh, the organizers actually offered free confidential counseling sessions to all attendees. You just had to, if you have a ticket to the conference, you would have 25 minutes for free, anonymously, with a professional counselor. Uh, and about one in 10 people actually went there and we got some anonymized data from those sessions. And of course, if you spend 25 minutes with a counselor, that's not enough to treat a depression, for example. But it can set people on a path towards feeling better. Um, sometimes that could be better self-care, it can be professional care, often a mix of both. And some of my favorite feedback that people gave on these sessions were someone who said, it's been a relief to finally say these things to someone and have acknowledgement of the problem. And I found it useful and relaxed and feel like I'm not crazy or alone, this is normal. And they reflect well about how people felt about these sessions. It's like not an immediate fix to everything that you struggle with. It's not a full treatment plan, uh, but it's a place to say things out loud and not worry about being judged, to feel validated and acknowledge that the things you struggle with are real and that you deserve to, to learn how to better take care of them, even if they're not the same or they might not be as serious as those of other people. And that's basically also the point of this talk. Uh, because I'm not actually a trained mental health professional, like my main job is actually Python development. So I cannot treat someone's eating disorder even if I had more time. Um, and after this talk, and even with other things people are doing in this space, like anxiety will still be there, like it doesn't just go away. But like short counseling sessions, even though we're not professionals, we can make a difference. And that we is not just me, it also includes all of you because we're all part of this community. And that means each of us has a chance to help with these things by being considerate, by being empathic, by being accepting and understanding to other people. And for example, help anyone who struggles to feel validated and not alone, because in the end, none of us are whether it's like serious, multiple, complicated, serious disorders, or sometimes just feeling like the stress is taking a toll on you, these struggles are valid because they have an impact on our lives. And it's important for all of us to remember and also carry out to others that whatever we're struggling with, you're not crazy, you aren't any less lovable, and most of all, not alone in the community. So, now that we know that we're not the only ones struggling uh, and not suffering from unicorn problems, let's talk about some of the first steps we can do to improve our own well-being and, and solve whatever is troubling us. Because the last thing that a lot of us want to admit is that we, we are struggling, that we can be overwhelmed and that we're not superhuman. But so how does that happen? How do you get up overwhelmed? Well, for one, most of us are mostly responsible and we are mostly functional adults. But still, it is so easy to end up in a situation where you're constantly fighting against all your work tasks, your projects, your conferences, your hobbies, your friends, your sleep. And most of us are probably generally well-liked. People value our contributions and our company. Uh, and many contributors get a lot of satisfaction from contributing to communities as well. But that is also exactly where the problem starts. Because somewhere along the way, it's easy to forget that you need to help yourself before you can help anyone else. Whether it's being excited about a project or invitation to speak at a conference or organize a conference, or the workplace increasing the workload because they think you're the rock star who can do anything. It is so easy to get caught up in a desire to contribute and to help to be part of something that you end up losing control over time, energy, and mental resources. 
But in the end, participating in anything is supposed to create a positive impact, not just on my peers, not just on my community or the entire world, but most of all on me. And if I forget that, then being helpful doesn't help me, and that is where things can get very dangerous. If that sounds selfish to you, consider that putting yourself first is, not a, is often not selfish and can even save lives. Um, if you've flown before, you might remember the oxygen mask instructions where they say, help yourself before assisting anyone else. And the reason for this is that if you struggle with someone else's oxygen mask and forget to put on your own, you'll pass out before you can help either of you, and none of you will receive any help. Whereas if you help yourself first, then you are in the position to help someone else before you pass out. So if you take care of your own well-being first, then you are still able to help other people. But if you prioritize these others over yourself, then you'll all run out of air before anyone is helped. And I'm also very much at risk of overcommitment because I get really excited about things or I get invited into something and it makes me feel valuable and validated, which makes it hard to turn down project offers or step down from something that I've already joined. And there are a few things that can make it very hard to say no to a potential project and even harder to say no more to something that you need to step down from. And um, from our own experience and what we saw in others, there are two very big reasons for it. Uh, being afraid that if you turn down or step down from something you have failed, or that other people will respond in a negative way. And so when I asked Mikey to help me build and present the first version of this talk, this was about two years ago, she had just changed careers for the third time, she moved cities, shifted from office work to home work, and she had a million projects going. And at some point I had to confront her with what in her own words she should have confronted herself with, that she was dropping the ball on this project, she was endangering the whole collaboration around this talk, um, because she tried to juggle too many things. But fortunately, we are very good friends, and we were building a talk about mental well-being. So we were able to have a very productive conversation about uh, what to do. But she had to. She admitted that she had a problem, and that she had to decide to drop some things from her life. Fortunately, she didn't end up dropping this talk, and that's why it exists today. But that was not an easy choice. And so we have to remember that sustainability is not just important for our open source software, it is also important for the open sourcer. Um, and it's simpler than you might think, because if I burn out, I am effectively useless to both myself and anyone else and any project that I'm on. So I cannot let short-term satisfaction or validation from myself or others impact my long-term capacity. So let's say you've now looked at all your project commitments and your free time or whatever is left of it at this point, and you realize that you have to balance your life better. Now you're going to have to communicate this to your peers, uh, which brings us to the second reason why is saying no more or no heart. What will people actually think of you? And unfortunately, even after you admit to yourself that you need to let go of some things, the next step of actually communicating this to your peers can seem even harder. Like, especially if you're a veteran contributor in the community, then, you know, the, the project will fill without you. You cannot let the community down. And this happens because we are very social creatures, and also a lot of our work doesn't have a clear finishing line. So we are, in a way, dependent. We are always developing. Things are often never done, so we're, it makes us very dependent on subjective feedback. And combining this with the culture of overachievement and overcommitment that we have in tech, it makes it, it can make saying no very scary. And when I wrote Mikey about my concerns about her dropping the ball in this talk, that was also not an easy email to write. I was very unhappy with how things were going at the time, and I was annoyed with her, but I also know her quite well. I care a lot about her, and I was sure she wasn't doing this because she didn't care about the project or about me because what we do isn't always who we are. And in a community of volunteer contributors, whether it's two people working on, working on a talk, or it's an open source community of thousands of people, volunteering means nobody has to do anything. We're doing this because we want to contribute, and because we get value from it, and give value also, uh, even more even than our jobs. But if we allow ourselves to suffer through our products, through our conferences, through our responsibilities, or if we had let building this talk damage our own well-being, then there is no love in the creative process, and we end up not serving anyone, least of all ourselves. 
And when you need to feel that eventually you need to step down from something, it's so easy to come up with so many imaginary scenarios of how people won't understand and how they respond badly. But I've done this plenty of times, especially since writing this talk. I've gotten better at it. And it's always gone well for me. And I've also only ever heard good stories. And if people do respond very badly, it's usually more an indication of their own insecurities because they will need to adjust to this also. So if we accept that we can only be helpful, if we retain our energy, our health, and our balance, then we can face others with confidence that we are, our actions aren't just helping ourselves, but also the community, because it makes space for someone else to step in. If I stay on a task that I'm not actually going to be able to complete, then I'm not just stressing out myself, but I'm not allowing someone else to do it either. It is as if you're licking the cookie, but not eating it. And so, and this is hard. This, this talk has made me a lot better at this uh, because I can practice what I preach. But in the end, our own imagination of others and how they will respond is almost always worse than reality. So remember to put your own oxygen mask on first because otherwise you're going to run out of air before anyone else can help you. And don't let your fears paralyze you from taking care of yourself. And this might sound easy, but there's a lot of things in our community that still push us towards overcommitment in tech. Um, and for our long-term well-being, it's very important that we acknowledge these and resolve these. One of my favorites used to be the GitHub contribution graph. This is how it was, I think, about one and a half years ago still. Uh, this was my own graph at the time, just before I did this talk for the first time. And you can see I'm pretty much used to this open source contributor. My longest streak is literally one day, which means no streak. Um, there's actually a lot more. Some of these were actually very complicated tasks in Django. Um, but still, um, like it's just a poor display, but it's also a thing that pushes people towards maintaining their streak, to pushing people to contribute something every day. I complained about this, and GitHub recognized this, and they removed the whole bottom part and improved the whole graph so that now you are no longer being rewarded for not taking any breaks ever. Um, which was very interesting because some people got very upset about me campaigning for this. Uh, my issue about this actually made number one hacker news. And someone ended up calling me part of a leftist tyranny that's oppressing them. And also it included the best way that I've ever been insulted on the internet because someone called me a neoliberal emotional crusader. <laughs> So yeah, there's a lot of work left to be done in this area. Some people will resist it, but things are improving. So next, I want to talk a little bit about asking for help, because I can say from experience that asking for help can be very hard, but it's okay to ask for help. It's not just difficult when it comes to well-being, but also in, in other settings. Um, in Django, we run development sprints where people get together for a few days and contribute to Django itself. There's often a lot of new first-time contributors, and they can be hesitant to ask for help with whatever they need, especially if they're more shy, if they're socially anxious, and things like that. So at one of the sprints, we told people, if you see anyone with a sailor hat, you can disrupt them for anything at any time, doesn't matter what it is. These people don't mind that you're disturbing them. You can ask them anything. And it works really well because people, it makes it much easier for people to get over their reluctance of asking somebody something. And it also works well for me because if I can't be disturbed for a while, maybe I'm too tired to listen to someone, I can just take off my hat and I won't have that role anymore. I can give it to someone else. And when I first started thinking about this talk, which is now three and a half years ago, wow, that's long. Um, it was very incomplete. Uh, I had some really good ideas. Some of them are still in here, but mostly it was there was just there was just not enough, and I wasn't able to fill in the missing parts. So about a year, uh, no, now like three years ago, I met Mikey for the first time, and we very quickly became friends. And I was still struggling with this talk when I at some point mailed her, and I'm pretty much quoting the original talk, uh, original mail. I said, I have this half-assed idea for a talk. It's full of holes. This is either my best or my worst idea ever for a talk. Here's some random incoherent ideas. I don't think I can finish this on my own. So maybe you want to join me and we'll build a talk out of this together. And so we started to work a few months later in our appropriately named secret GitHub repo. And 
what it comes down to is this. If I had not asked Mikey to help me build this talk, it would never have happened. I would not have been here at all. I wouldn't have been in this city. And sometimes asking for help can feel like failing, like admitting that there's something you can't do. It could be a talk, could be a conference, could be some new feature that you're trying to introduce into some software. It could be about feeling unwelcome in a community due to social anxiety or needing a lot of quiet time. Um, asking for help does mean that you admit difficulty in doing something, but that is rather, that's not failing, it's rather the opposite. Because if I would try to organize a conference on my own, I actually think it might literally kill me. So I either do this with other people and I ask for help and I offer help all the time. And because otherwise it won't happen at all. If I try to do this talk on my own, then it would not have happened at all either. So that would have been the only way I would have failed. Um, and also when you struggle with things, it's very tempting to just stick our head in the sand and, and pretend they don't exist because asking for help can also make it feel more real than it was before. But this is an illusion, right? So some, something that you're struggling with, it doesn't become real the moment you ask for help. It was already real. You were just trying to hide from it. Also, I do know, oh, Beamer died. This is one of my best slides. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so yeah, another thing is that asking for help is, is also dangerous because it means that it can make you feel like nobody wants to help, but most people are not actually telepathic. So they often don't know what I need. The only way for people to allow people to help me is uh, if I ask them, if I tell them what I need. Like when I speak at conferences, I often ask to be scheduled somewhat early. This is a very short conference, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, because it makes me feel better. I'm more comfortable if I don't speak on the very last day of a four-day conference. It doesn't always work out, but nobody has ever responded badly to that request. So I ask, they have a chance to help me. Sometimes they can't, that's okay. But you may find that if you make a habit of asking for what you need, you'll be surprised how much is actually possible and how eager people are often to help you. And I feel like this quote from a TEDx talk captures it very well. I know that vulnerability is kind of the core of shame and fear in our, in our struggle for worthiness, but it appears it is also a birthplace of joy, creativity, of belonging, and of love. And this is the same about asking for help. Asking for help is a kind of vulnerability. Asking for help can also be scary because, you know, maybe people will make fun of you. Maybe they will ridicule you. Mikey could have said to me, this is a ridiculous idea for a talk and you are an idiot for even proposing this. Uh, but in my experience, that is very, very rare. But if you do reach out for help and people do respond in this bad way, it doesn't, it's, that's not about you. It doesn't reflect on you. It doesn't make it wrong. It just means that other person is toxic and they're not your friend. I honestly also have no idea how often I have asked for help, how often I will. It could be for my friends, it could be for my peers in a community, it could be with code, with organizing, or when I'm not feeling well. And I can tell you that even with everything I've just told you, it's still hard. Even after doing this talk for quite a few times, it's still hard, um, even though I strongly believe in everything I said. But I've almost never regretted it, and it's almost always been a great relief. So. Don't expect that it'll become easy, but when in doubt, push yourself a little more to open up. I said before that no matter what you're struggling with, that doesn't make you any less lovable. But all of us don't actually feel as appreciated as we actually are. And um, I was also one of the organizers of Django Underhood, big conference in Amsterdam. My job was dealing with Dutch people. And as some people in this room can tell you, organizing a conference is a lot of work and it's very stressful. There's venues, speakers, sponsors, tickets, budgets, food, uh, there's all your communication, there's code of conduct, there's artwork, all kinds of random support. There's things that almost go horribly wrong that you quickly fix behind the scenes. And I feel like I'm able to do this because this is very short and I have a team that supports me. Um, and that where I feel I can ask for help if I need it. But most of all, all the stress that it involves, the effort it requires, the things that almost go horribly wrong, they're worth it to me when I get an email from an attendee like this. I feel totally overwhelmed, surprised, and very, very grateful. Thank you for caring. You are unbelievable. You are a bunch of the craziest, the most positive people I've met. You inspire me to give back to the community even more. I wish I could express properly what I'm feeling right now. 
May it always rain strawb apples on you, but not all the time. That could be inconvenient. Only when you feel like having strawb apples, or someone that you like feels like having strawb apples, or just want to make it rain strawb apples. Sending hugs, you crazy, amazing people. We got this email from an attendee that needed some help. We were able to offer it, and it wasn't the only one like this. And if you've ever done this kind, if you don't know what a straw valve is, by the way, I brought some, so you can try them later. They're very good. Um, so it's also very important to have a team that supports you. Because even when you need help, when you need to step back, when you flake at something and when you make a mistake at something, you're probably much more appreciated than you think. Because almost all of us sometimes flake and almost all of us sometimes make mistakes. And we all, um, but most importantly, other people are there to support us when it happens. Unfortunately, our reality is often still like this, where we feel we don't need to tell someone we like their work, but can be much more vocal about when we dislike them. But this feeling that you've made a difference and that the work matters, that you've made an impact, is incredibly important, even more so to people who already struggle with their well-being, which is about documentation, writing code, building events, any of that. Um, for me, definitely, seeing emails like the one I showed you before can have uh, can make a big difference, and I feel that the community would be an even better place if we had more of that. So, together with Mikey, we built open source happiness packets because openly expreciating gratitude or happiness towards other people can be hard. We tend to have a reluctance to do that. And so, with happiness packets, it's a very simple platform, and you can send nice messages to other people that you appreciate or are grateful to. You can send them anonymous if you want, but you don't. We encourage sharing your name, but you don't have to. We've had over 700 sent so far. 100 are published on our website with permission. And we're really excited to, to have built this and to see so how far it's already gone. And some of my favorite tweets about receiving happiness packets are someone who said, speaking from experience, receiving a happiness packet is an amazingly fussy feeling. Go send one and make someone's day. As someone who said, Jamcon Europe received a happiness packet and I teared up at a bus stop while reading it. Um, I also have stickers, not actually these stickers anymore. We have much better stickers now and some other swag, so find me later. The other swag is a surprise. Also, I brought some baffles. And um, so, yeah, that almost brings us to the end. Um, there's a few more things I want to say. Um, if you like this kind of the kind of things, the kind of happy messages, you should follow this bot on Twitter. It's called Yay Friends, and it tweets all sorts of nice things. It's very nice and affirming. And the cutest thing is, if you retweet something it said, it'll send you a message just for you as a reply. Um, if you're on Twitter, follow this bot. There's a few other ones like this. Um, Send, I encourage you to send your own happiness packets on happinesspackets.io. We're on Twitter as happiness packet because otherwise it's too long for a Twitter username or planning there. And I know it's like initially it might feel a little weird to send one of these, uh, but you are really make once you get over that, you are really making a big difference, not just to the person that you're sending it to, but to yourself as well. Because of sending a happiness packet to someone and sharing something nice with someone is an amazingly fuzzy feeling. Um, we also found a whole bunch of resources while working on this. Uh, not nearly all of them made it into this talk, so there's the GitHub repo. Uh, all of them are in there. Our slides are in there. Uh, there's also a link to my less obvious conference checklist, which is a vaguely related project for tips on making conferences nicer in ways that are less obvious that you don't always think about. I'm going to be here the rest of the day. Um, if you can't find me, tweet me, but it's a small venue. And you know, whether it's like to talk about something that resonated from the talk or something you want to share, or and this talk does this to people, if something hit very close to home and you just need to share a hug. Um, and lastly, I want to stress that wanting to be happier, it's not that doesn't make you selfish or negative or ungrateful, because we all deserve to be as happy as we can. Because we are appreciated, you matter, and you are enough. So please be kind to each other but also especially to yourself. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sasha. Um, I think that's a very important topic. 
uh, not that bifunctors aren't also important, but you can't write bifunctors. Take care of yourself. Any questions? Yeah, actually, it's not a question. I just wanted to thank you because I, I too, always hated the GitHub streak. So thank you. Thank you. More questions. If you want to ask a question later in private or you come up with something, then you know, feel free to. It usually takes a bit of time for people to work out their thoughts. Okay, then let's thank Sasha again.